Good day, everyone. We're here at the Postgraduate Institute of Management, where the AMDISA 2016 Executive Council and Regional Conference is currently underway. It is hosted by the Postgraduate Institute of Management, University of Sri Jawadhanapura, and the Institute of Certified Professional Managers. Here with us now is Dr. Hassan Shoeb Murad, Rector, University of Management and Technology in Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, welcome to our program. Thank you. Uh, so you were the session chairman for uh, the second session, which uh, was entitled Strategic Actions and Networking, Key Initiatives. Could you tell us a little bit about what was discussed? Uh, this was a very interesting session. Uh, there were four speakers, uh, Dr. Padam, who is a very senior management experts from uh, India. He elaborated uh, upon the idea of SACWIS, which is South Asian Quality System a system which has been developed by MDSA to help business schools uh, uh, improve themselves and achieve the standards. Uh, it is an indigenous system. It has gone through uh, developmental process and it has evolved over the la period of last five years. It has its own structure it, and process. Uh, Dr. Padam gave us the background of SACWIS, the history of SACWIS, its structure and processes. Uh, then came uh, Dr. Elawadi uh, from uh, Institute of Technology Management, Hyderabad, India. And uh, he uh, highlighted uh, the requirements of uh, quality system. Quality is something which is uh, intrinsic as well as extrinsic and it, it, is, it uh, necessitates uh, coordination of all aspects of uh, productivity uh, in terms of business organizations and education in the university. So he uh, gave us uh, the, an x-ray of the uh, details that are very important to be kept in mind by the, by the uh, deans of uh, higher education. Uh, the third speaker was uh, uh, Dr. Uh, he was Director General of Sri Lanka Institute of Development, and uh, he gave he was his uh, his uh, idea was that we should keep in our mind the overall imperative of organizational development and organizational improvement, and these systems are meant to help us. Uh, grow the organization, transform the organizations. So he made a very passionate uh, appeal. Uh, if I recall, his name was Dr. Three Silikari. Uh, Three and uh, so his presentation was very good. And uh, the last presentation was uh, made by the dean of uh, IBA from uh, University of Dhaka. Uh, Professor uh, Saiful Majid, and uh, he also uh, highlighted a few aspects of quality, which means that we need to have more uh, interaction, and we need to have uh, better collaboration, so that we can together achieve uh, better quality. So this was uh, focused upon quality and its various uh, aspects. Okay, all right. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the university that you are part of, uh, University of Management and Technology in Lahore? Uh, UMT is uh, in Lahore, uh, which is the historical city of uh, Pakistan, uh, a city having a very live culture, known for its uh, throbbing uh, people and its uh, food and gardens. Uh, we are uh, we are based in Lahore. We have a sub campus then in another city which is uh, near about Lahore, uh, Sialkot, which is very enterprising and uh, famous for uh, football, surgical items, uh, cutlery, leather items, things like that. Uh, this university currently has 9,000 students and uh, 10 schools. Uh, it is not just limited to IT or uh, business, but uh, also has a very uh, comprehensive uh, range of programs in social sciences, in law, and in other degrees. 
uh, university uh, has a history of about uh, 10 years, 12 years now as a chartered university. Previously, it was affiliated. In all, it is about now 20 years uh, old institution. Uh, we have uh, achieved SACWAS uh, about uh, four years back. So we are SACWAS accredited institution, one of the three SACWAS accredited institution in Lahore. Uh, we have 450 full-time teaching staff, uh, out of which about 120 are 120 hold doctoral degrees. So we have a good faculty, good programs, and it's a great great place to learn. Our mission is uh, to lead, and uh, our vision is to learn. So we uh, we are very active and a very competitive institution. So uh, would you recommend uh, that universities here in Sri Lanka uh, take on that SACWIS acc accreditation? I think so. You know, we have had very good experience and uh, we think that we have learned through this process. Uh, you know, there are many things that we think, okay, we will do at some point and we keep delaying them. And uh, SACWIS became an external factor which uh, forced everyone to do s whatever was not done by that time. So all faculty members and administrative staff, the leadership, governance, everyone then uh, you know, were brought to one page and we took that document as something that we have to achieve. So it helped us achieve. Not that we were not geared to it before or we were not uh, cognizant of its uh, importance, but then SACWIS gave us the milestone and it uh, forced upon us a time schedule that do this by now, do this by now, do this by now. So I think it's a very useful forum. It's a very useful uh, inst instrument. And then once you achieve SACWIS, then you can go to uh, even uh, refer to European or an American accreditation system. So it's a gateway to go to European and American. So it is the first step. Take this step first. And once you are sequestered, then you can prepare yourself for European, which we are do doing now. After having done sequestered, we immediately shifted our attention to European and then American. So it helped us, uh, and also it gained uh, gain, it, it uh, helped us gain more credibility in the eyes of European accrediting bodies, uh, which uh, do not accept, uh, even do not consider uh, institutions as eligible even uh, uh, without uh, having substantial uh, uh, you know credentials so i think it's a good institution and uh, good first step a good first step mm -hmm. yeah all right could you tell us a little bit about uh, pakistan the government's involvement in the education system uh, you know uh, governments uh, take care of uh, primary education and uh, secondary education and uh, they try to provide, uh, it, is, it, it is their responsibility by constitution to provide education to the citizens, uh, but they lack resources, so they have also involved private sector. They have given a space to private sector. About 40% of education in the schools and colleges and universities now is uh, now has been taken up by the private sector. Uh, government is also handing over some of its public institutions uh, to private sector that you can you manage it and they will pay to the private sector per student the fee in terms of fee what was their in the, what was their cost when they were main managing those institutions hoping that at least there will be efficiency and there will be movement towards the standardization they will be more uh, updated in terms of curriculum so government is uh, is doing whatever it can, you know, then, uh, you know, the, the government of Punjab has really done well. They have offered a scholarship to all the students uh, who are need them uh, on merit. They have offered foreign scholarships. They have set up really some leading institutions in the, under the name of Danish schools for the very poor, uh, but providing them the best first class services as if you will have in any convent or any uh, you know, any 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 top school. So the uh, the poorest of the poor getting the top of class, uh, you know, educational facilities. So these are some of the things. And in higher education, the government is very interested. 
uh, for public sector, they have uh, open grants for everything that they want to do, that they need to do, infrastructure, operations, faculty training, they spend a lot on, on them. Uh, for private sector, yes, a little bit uh, in terms of some facilities in conferences and some facilities in research and some facilities in uh, training, but not much. So government uh, ought to do more, you know, we, uh, government of Pakistan is not spending even 2% of GNP on education, which is very bad. Uh, it should be spending at least 4%, as which is the recommendation by UNESCO. Uh, so that is, still we are very short. We have a huge uh, youth population, children population, which is two-third of our overall population. And unless we do something now in this time, in their time span, when they are kid and when they are teen and when they are uh, youth, for their trick, for their education, basic education and for their employability, if we are not able to do anything now, then it will be, they will pass time and uh, they will lose the opportunities. So we have to make most of this uh, population and uh, the only way we can do, we are able to ensure is through education. So uh, while I appreciate whatever government is doing, I think they are short by at least 50%. Right. And how accessible is education in Pakistan, the current day? Uh, I think uh, uh, there is an ex issue of uh, access uh, and uh, equity. Uh, even if uh, access, there is uh, there are uh, there is access uh, available, then it is not affordable. Uh, and if there is access av available, then it is not up to the mark. So there are issues in of access, especially remote areas, rural areas. Uh, I don't think there is uh, there is issue of access in urban areas or semi-urban areas. But remote areas, yes, there is issue of access. We need more schools, and we need more faculty teachers. So if there are schools, then maybe they lack teachers. If there are schools, then they lack facilities. They they just in bare minimum infrastructure, which is not very helpful. So th if there is a school, then, uh, but uh, it is at a far away, it is at a distance, and not many people would agree to send their daughters uh, at such a far-flung, uh, you know, school. So that is, school is available, but it is uh, at a, such a distance which is uh, discouraging them. So we have, an, we have issue of access, and uh, I think government should, in this development planning, should take care of it and should do whatever it can to now it's time because Pakistan is one of I don't want to say it at the international forum but Pakistan is one of the few countries uh, which uh, were not able to achieve millennium development goals which is which is very sad you know which Pakistan should have achieved by 2015 and uh, there are many s other countries in South Asia were able to do that and I know Sri Lanka has very good education system in primary level and secondary level. And Sri Lankan workforce is highly appreciated uh, at international level. I see them in Middle East. I see them uh, even in Europe. So we, we think that we can learn from Sri Lankan model how to make their the work, how to make young people more productive, more employable and uh, more uh, useful so that they can lead their life, at, they can be at peace, they can be, uh, you know, happy and prosperous within their own area and contribute to the development. Uh, you mentioned an example of the Danish, Danish school? Danish school. Danish school. Uh, what has the, uh, what has, what has become of that, as in what is the outcome that you are seeing? Uh, you know, uh, people who have been involved in that and uh, who have seen that, uh, I didn't have the chance to go there, uh, but uh, they talk very highly about it. You know, there are ex exceptionally good campuses. You can uh, envy uh, the facilities, the f equipment, the classroom, teachers, infrastructure. 
someone who came from United States and visited one school, he was telling me that he thought they are palaces. He, th he thought he's entering into a palace. So they are really well furnished and the objective is that poorest of the poor should go through this education and should be a cause for mobility of the whole and transformation of a people in the whole area. So you, they pick up people who even uh, don't have uh, enough of uh, clothing or who, have, who don't have shoes in their uh, you know, uh, feet and uh, they are, don't have shelter. So they pick up those and they put them into a very out class institution and it is certainly uh, not free of criticism because people are saying that what about those uh, hundreds and thousands who are already in government uh, institutions. So instead of giving so much to very few, uh, why not distribute it to and make the whole, make, make an effort to increase the standards of all of the institutions. So this is a criticism uh, to which government normally responds by saying that yes, we want to create some islands of standards and which can make us proud of that yes, we have done something for the, for the poor. But on the other hand, uh, uh, they are also taking care of the lack of uh, infrastructure, or facilities, or equipment in the general schools. And, uh, but that progress is, I believe, a little slow. I would like to see um, that more needs to be done and uh, should have been done by previous government. There were enough funds. There are never shortage of, there's never shortage of funds for education. It is just that, uh, we lack resolve and we lack, uh, we don't have, uh, we are not clear about the prop, about the uh, priority. All right. Um, at uh, UMT, uh, what are, is research uh, a big component of uh, the education there? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, you know, we are in higher education and in, if, we are, if we think of ourselves in higher education, then it is actually research-based, research-driven and uh, research has to be one key outcome of whatever we do. I would uh, admit that it is not to the extent that we would like it to be, but it is starting. Uh, we are uh, certainly research needs funding, separate funding. Uh, when most of the f resources that in university generates comes through tuition, it is not possible to allocate uh, fund, educate funds for research because tuition allows you to make, uh, you know, the pro provide the essentials, the basics. You know, it doesn't even cover the developmental costs. For that, we have to mobilize resources separately. So research needs uh, more funding. But uh, if you can see, our student-teacher ratio is one to twenty almost. And we have so many PhDs, 120 plus. Uh, so reason we have those PhDs, and we are continuously inviting uh, more and trying to, you know, attract more, uh, is that we want to strengthen our research. So research is something that is in our uh, planning. That is uh, currently the uh, the priority. And I hope that, uh, you know, institutions have their own phases of uh, development. So the first phase was infrastructure, second phase was uh, formation of programs, disciplines, the third phase was uh, quality, you know, the fourth phase is uh, having good faculty uh, and better faculty and competitive faculty. And then the phase uh, is of, uh, phase comes of uh, collaboration, interaction, and more partnerships. So now it's about uh, research. And I think in about a year, uh, there has a, there's a good progress in the last two, three years. But uh, those who haven't produced any research for the last three years, we recently sent them a letter that, look, you have not produced anything in the last three years. So should we keep you on? Or should we replace you with someone who is uh, more uh, habitual and trained in doing the research? So we are taking steps, and uh, with some efforts, I think we will do better. 
In terms of funding for research, is it uh, usually uh, perhaps government or from the corporate sector that you would uh, seek for the funding? Right now, uh, mainly uh, it is government. Uh, and But corporate sector is ready to give funding for their projects. So for student projects in the, the final year, and uh, that areas where they where we deal with their problems so if research is about corporate projects and it's problem solving then yes there is funding available mm -hmm. and we, that is uh, we do take advantage of that uh, but for the research broad based and uh, discipline based theoretical research and thematic research uh, it is the higher education commission which comes up with the funding. Right. Private sector will not give you enough of the funds in science or uh, in other areas which will help you uh, build your laboratories mm -hmm. which you need for research in science. Mm -hmm. uh, but the government is, uh, you know, uh, is considerate of the need of uh, laboratories and when they approve a project, it also contains uh, procurement of uh, uh, equipment. So, for uh, research, I think it's the government uh, mainly that is still the source of uh, funding. All right. Uh, the graduates uh, that come out of uh, UMT, uh, do they usually head abroad or do they stay on in the country and engage in the corporate sector? Uh, I, I must mention here that uh, over the last, uh, you know, uh, 15, 16 years, we have also received uh, students from Sri Lanka. And I think uh, about more than half a dozen came to us and have studied with us. And uh, they're back in Sri Lanka and they're serving in various sectors. So we have had very good relationship with Sri Lanka. After 9-11 it stopped, uh, but we are trying to put it back uh, and hope to have more students from Sri Lanka study with us. Uh, our students uh, mainly, uh, they, when they graduate, they divide. They are divided into five categories. <laughs> Since I, I know this, uh, the answer to this question because we have discussed about it, you know, ourselves. <laughs> so don't think that I thought it just now. <laughs> so the first is, uh, of course, uh, those who come from business families, especially SMEs. And so they straight away go back to their businesses of the family businesses and their parents and their uncles or whatever. So that's the first category. And we do receive a lot of them because they can afford higher education at private level sector. And their purpose to gain in a specific education in engineering or business is to then get back to their family businesses. And uh, when they come here, it is the, the investment that is done by their parents. Second category is for those who then, uh, uh, you know, uh, go for uh, open recruitments and uh, to um, uh, national corporations, conglomerates, uh, multinationals, and uh, they are good, they are well prepared, and they make sure that their academics is good, and uh, they are sharp, and uh, they then go for the jobs, and they go into the, those uh, open management training officers uh, recruitment programs and other areas. The third category is uh, of those uh, who uh, come from abroad, for example, expat Pakistanis in about half a dozen countries like Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Emirat, uh, Emirates, uh, uh, Muscat Oman and other places of the world, you know, now, now we are also getting students from Canada, expat Pakistani families in the uh, United States for the professional programs. If they don't get admission there, then they come to Pakistan to study with us and then they go back to their own places. So this is the third category, expat Pakistanis who come to us and get training, educated here and then they immediately go back. They retain their visa while they are steady here. Uh, the fourth category is of those who want to go to higher education. They are not uh, interested in job, they just want to go to higher education. And the fifth category is of those who are, uh, uh, you know, in the uh, open pool, but they are not really ready. They are, they are among the bottom of the uh, graduate class, 
and they are confused to what to do and what not to do and uh, they have different ideas they have different plans uh, whether they should go for uh, you know job here or job abroad and the last category which is very important to us uh, are consist of those who immediately go for uh, an entrepreneurial career uh, they have a product in mind they have a business in mind and they get the funds they get they make the plans and they develop the project and as soon as they graduate they go for their entrepreneurial career and so this is the sixth category so we have these six categories uh so the last category that you mentioned uh it seems that many of the people that I've spoken to uh who come from different universities in the region uh they do emphasize about uh their business schools uh developing entrepreneurs and uh, what are, are there any special steps that you all have taken at uh UMT we are very keen on entrepreneurship uh, we have uh, star we started courses on entrepreneurship from you know in 1990s i myself taught a course on new venture creation in mid 90s so we are very old in player in that and uh, uh, you know entrepreneurship is about developing a leadership caliber it's so that the students can take it take risk can uh, think out of the box can uh, critically see the existing products and services and uh, come up with some innovative and creative ideas as to how to improve upon them and they should be good in uh, communication they should be good in team building and they should be output looking they should be very dynamic and active so that they can uh, go through the tests and the challenges that are faced by the entrepreneurs so we do a lot of things for example skills development uh, uh, courses on uh, entrepreneurship and sme and small business uh, we take them uh, through special lectures by un- successful entrepreneurs uh, we help them develop their own plans we take them through uh, uh, product development and there are so many exhibits there are so many competitions uh, for uh, entrepreneurial ideas our students normally go and participate in those competitions and they come back with lot with prizes and with recognition which makes us very happy uh, so entrepreneurship is something which is a holistic development of the personality a uh, way of life and uh, the just, just it's not just one thing that you need that you need to do in one place uh, there are 10 things that you need to do in 10 places and not just one time but throughout their stay so it helps and we have our own entrepreneurial club those who have become entrepreneurs successfully after they graduated so they are source of inspiration for these and they get connected with them and uh, these is the entrepreneurs then get ideas from them and uh, they are on their own uh, but certainly we need to do a lot more all right um having participated uh in the amdisa 2016 uh, regional conference uh, where do you see scope for uh for umt to engage with uh, some of the other universities and bodies that have come here uh, you know amdisa is about uh, cooperation and participation within south asia it is a very useful forum i been the, i attended the first mdsa meeting in 1996 i think in colombo <laughs> so i think this is after this is after 21 years that i am here again for an mdsa meeting so i found mdsa really good because uh, mdsa help us interact with institutions in india in sri lanka in bangladesh bhutan and maldives uh, so this is a very good forum and uh, at umt we are committed for mdsa uh, umt is also the host institution for mdip which is the nest pakistani association uh, association of management development institutions in pakistan so this is uh, our lifelong commitment i believe we will always have that office with us uh, so we i think have a very strong commitment uh, with mdsi we think that we, we are not closer enough we are not still uh, cooperating with, with each other the way we cooperate with institutions in europe and america uh there are some differences there are some political differences which are not allowing us to 
really collaborate with each other but uh, we are managing it uh, last 21 years you know i have seen it has not been easy but um, certainly workable and feasible and uh, with every year we become more convinced of its importance and uh, that we should we must continue with it and uh, so our uh, uh, our enthusiasm and our support to whatever mdsa does is uh, unwavered has stood unwavered over the last decades and it, that would be how that is how how it is going to be in future as well and uh, especially important because as you said there is a window of opportunity here to educate uh, the younger generation that's coming up now and uh, and it's a very important task. Yeah, I look forward to it. Uh, I especially I look forward to making UMT more relevant and more beneficial and more connected with Sri Lanka since I am here now. And uh, I found I found uh, goodwill uh, among the people of Sri Lanka, among the government and the higher ups uh, in Sri Lanka. Whoever whoever I have met has been very open, uh, has been very forthcoming and welcoming us. So I've uh, been overwhelmed by that uh, Sri Lankan, uh, you know, positive, uh, uh, you know, uh, attitude towards uh, Pakistan. And uh, I would like to build bridges in the area of uh, education so that uh, uh, our national linkages are also stronger in the future. Uh, what are your thoughts on e-learning in Pakistan? Like yeah, e-learning is, is uh, e-learning has taken shape and is now mm -hmm. uh, something which is the nightmare of educational institution <laughs> that we are running an educational institution and we sometimes uh, we have this nightmare. Oh, if e-learning catches up. And everything is through server. Where will where will we be? So, uh, but no, it is not uh, just a nightmare. Uh, uh, it is an opportunity, and uh, we will take. Uh, we are thinking of taking advantage of that. You know, we. Uh, I think all institutions are now, in some way, utilizing the technology. Uh, all of our courses are. Uh, internet based you know we have our own learning management system LMS so that we are using uh, but uh, we haven't got all the lectures video recorded and uploaded so lectures are live lectures lectures uh, are in classroom and but LMS is there to reinforce our teaching and uh, so this is how we can uh, we are uh, trying to uh, trying to utilize the the e-learning uh, technology, uh, but there are institutions totally uh, based upon uh, you know e-learning. They don't have any brick and mortar campus. They don't have any address, and they are all you know IT based. So they are also doing well, and they have a place to you know they have a they have a segment to uh, to to address. Uh, I personally feel that uh, education will uh, never be free of face-to-face uh, -face contact and face-to-face uh, uh, -face contact and face-to-face -face teaching will always be regarded as uh, important and as uh, priority and will always be there. It will become more expensive. The rates of face-to-face uh, -face based uh, direct teaching and learning will increase more rapidly than, for instance, uh, CPI, cons uh, Consumer Price Index. It will reach, it will increase by 2 to 4 to 5 to maybe 10 multiple multiples of CPI because of the uh, costs associated with it, uh, which will then create a room for more room for e-learning because that will be not that uh, expensive, right? So a combination of face-to-face uh, -face and e-learning would be an ideal, and uh, that is what we are planning at UMT. Uh, and we hope that uh, 
humans uh, will always be uh, appreciative and uh, be uh, uh, be able to differentiate uh, that face to face has more to offer than e learning Okay, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us um, and for joining us on our program. Thank you, you're welcome. Thank you.